Hello again, everyone. This is Mr. B. Hill, and we're going to continue on talking about simplified radical form today. Uh, last video, we talked about uh, these first two criteria for simplified radical form. One being that there's no perfect square factors under the radical, <coughs> which we took care of by using the product property of square roots, um, just splitting up the radical into to both factors, essentially distributing the radical to both factors under the radical, and also we talked about combining like radical terms. Today, we're going to add two more criteria. The first one we're going to be, or this third one technically now, it means we're going to have no fractions underneath the radical, and finally, we can't have any radicals in the denominator of a fraction. So this first one used the product property. This third one, we're going to make use of the division property for square roots. So basically, how to deal with criterion three. is just using what we call the division property of square roots. And what that says, basically if we have the square root of a quotient, we can distribute that square root to both the numerator and denominator. It works the exact same way as the product property, because division is the same thing as multiplication, and basically radicals are exponents. It's an exponent of one half. So we just distribute that exponent of one half to both the numerator and the denominator, like that. Just to use some numbers here, show you a little simple example here, if we had, say, the square root of 3 fourths. Well, we have this fraction underneath the radical sign. We can't have that, so we're just going to distribute that square root to both the numerator and the denominator. And then we can see that, oh, nice, we know what the square root of 4 actually is. So this is just the square root of 3 over 2. And now this is simplified because, well, there's no more, more arithmetic we can do. 3 certainly doesn't have any perfect square factors in it. Uh, there's no like radical terms in here. We no longer have a fraction underneath the radical. And, lucky for us, the numerator is also not under a radical. Excuse me, the denominator. But that one's pretty simple. Let's work through a little bit more complicated example. We'll call this one example two. Let's see here. Let's just take a big square root. And then in the numerator we'll have 12 x to the fifth y and then in the denominator we'll have 3 x to the power of negative 1 times y cubed and all of that is underneath the square root now there's no one way of simplifying any of these things you can do, jumble around the steps however you want but my advice is to always try to do as much simplification inside the radical as you can before you try splitting it up. And there's other techniques. As you do 500 of these problem, problems, you start seeing how you should really go about it uh, right off the bat. But my advice also is just deal with the constants and then each of the variables separately in a weird way. So right there, we just see that 12 over 3. Well, we would know what 12 thirds is. 12 divided by 3 is, of course, 4. So, we can simplify that down. 12 divided by 3 is going to leave us with 4 in the numerator. Dealing with just the x's, we have x to the fifth on top, x to the negative 1 on bottom. And so the quotient rule of exponents says, of course, well, we're going to subtract these exponents. 5 minus a negative 1 gives us a positive 6, so we have x to the 6th, like that. Finally, dealing with just the y's, see we have y on top and y cubed on bottom, so really we have y to the first up here, and again quotient rule for exponents says we're going to subtract these exponents, so 1 minus a 3, gives us with negative 2, 
So that's y to the negative 2. The negative sign means we're going to have y squared on bottom. You could also think about it as just we have one y up here and three factors of y down here. So this one y will cancel with one of those three, leaving with us with two factors of y on bottom. Now let's simplify a little bit more. Now we have this quotient underneath the radical, so we can split that up. And we'll take the square root of the numerator, 4x to the sixth, and then we'll split this up and we have the square root of y squared on bottom. Now this is nice because of course the square root of y squared is of course y because y if you take that and square it, you get y squared. So the square root of y squared is just y. So that's what's on bottom. And on top we have the square root of 4 times x to the sixth. But we're not done yet. Because yes, notice we can still simplify this numerator a good bit. We can split up this radical to these two factors in the numerator. So we still have our y on bottom, but we're going to distribute this radical to both the 4 and the x to the 6th. So this numerator becomes the square root of 4 times the square root of x to the power of 6. But now we know what each of these square roots actually is. The square root of 4 is, of course, just 2. And the square root of x to the 6th, well, what do I square to give me x to the 6th? That's going to be x cubed. And we still have our y on bottom. And now this is our simplified expression. 2x cubed over y. Let's do one more example here. Suppose let's have, we'll have a 4 outside everything. Why not? And inside we'll do a square root of 2x cubed over 96x to the power of negative 3. Going down a little bit more. There we go. We don't really need these parentheses here, but I left them in just because if I didn't have them, it might look like this 4 was a little bit closer to this radical. And that's kind of dangerous because we do have another symbol for the fourth root of something, which is really just a radical sign with a little tiny 4 right in here. And I was worried that the 4 times might look like that. But we don't need to worry about it right now because we're not dealing with fourth roots. We're only dealing with square roots for our purposes. So again, I'm going to simplify what's inside first just to make our life a little bit simpler. So we've still got this 4 that everything's going to be multiplied by. And now inside the radical, we've got a 2 on top and a 96 on bottom. We can simplify that down. 2 96 is the same thing as 1 48th. We don't need to write that 1. So we just have a 48 on bottom. And then x cubed divided by x to the negative 3 Again, quotient rule for exponents, we subtract them. 3 minus a negative 3 gives us, of course, x to the 6th. Now we can split up. Oops, I'm sorry, I forgot my radical. Can't do that. Now we're going to split up this radical between the numerator and the denominator using that division property for square roots. So we still have 4 times. Now we have the square root of x to the sixth on top and the square root of 48 on bottom. And now we're taking the square root of x to the sixth, though what do we need to square to give us x to the sixth? That's of course x cubed. And on bottom, well, oh, hey, wait a second here. 48, pretty sure that has a perfect square factor in it. And if you're clever, you'll notice that it's 16. It's a bigger one. So, we can rewrite the square root of 48 as a square root of 16 times 3. If you didn't notice that, you could factor out a 4 first and then factor out another 4, but we'll 
we did that last time. And now we can split up the square root inside here. So we have x cubed on top still. And then the square root of 16 times the square root of 3 on bottom. We just distributed this radical to both factors of 16 and 3. So now we have 4 times. We have x cubed on top. But we know what the square root of 16 is. That's 4. Still have our square root of 3 there. And then now we have 4. Really, it's in the numerator. If we wanted to do the multiplication in here, we could, maybe just to see it easier. Now we have 4 times x cubed. Because right, this is actually 4 divided by 1. Multiply numerators, multiply denominators over 4 times the square root of 3. And of course, our factors of 4 will cancel out. And now we have x cubed over the square root of 3. And that would be simplified except for criterion 4. Notice we have a square root of 3, or a radical, in the denominator. And we can't have that for it to be fully simplified. So we need a way of getting rid of this, this square root in the denominator. So how to deal with criterion 4. And that is a little something that we call rationalizing the denominator. Because right now what we have is we have an irrational number of square root of 3 in the denominator. We don't want that. But it's pretty easy to deal with. All we do is we're going to take this x cubed over the square root of 3 and we're going to multiply it by 1. Because multiplying by 1 doesn't change anything. but we're going to write that one in kind of a funny way. We're going to write the one as this radical in the denominator on top of itself. Sorry about that. No way to get around bells in here. So we're going to multiply this slightly unsimplified expression by 1. But our 1 is just the square root of 3 over the square root of 3. Whatever irrational number is down here, we need to make that on top of itself, and that's what we're going to be multiplying by. The reason why we do that now, well, we multiply straight across the numerator times, nu times numerator, x cubed times the square root of 3 on top, and in bottom we have the square root of 3 times the square root of 3, which is, of course, just 3. Because the square root of 3 is the thing that when you square it, you get 3. So square root of 3 times square root of 3, or square root of 3 squared, is of course just 3. And now we're completely good. Inside of our radical, we don't have any perfect square factors, and now we don't have uh, a radical in the denominator, which is nice. Let's go through one more example here. Example 4, and this one will be a little bit more complicated. So we'll have the square root of 42x cubed over 6y. Again, I always advise to simplify inside the radical as much as you can first. So, of course, 46 div or, excuse me, 42 divided by 6 is just 7. So we have here square root of 7x cubed over y. And then we can split up the radical between the numerator and the denominator. Square root of 7x cubed over the square root of y. And now we have this 
radical in the denominator, which we'll have to rationalize. But really quick, just to deal with it, I happen to have a perfect square factor inside the radical in the numerator. Because x cubed actually has a factor of x squared in it. So we could rewrite this as the square root of x squared times 7x on top, and we still have our square root of 1 on bottom. Now we can split up this radical in the numerator and have it be the square root of x squared times the square root of 7x on top of the square root of y. The reason we do that is because we know what the square root of x squared is. That's just x. Everything else is the same. And now we're going to pull our little rationalizing trick and multiply by 1. But now our radical on bottom is the square root of y. So we're going to write that one as the square root of y over the square root of y. This up here. So now we just multiply straight across numerator times numerator and denominator times denominator. So in the numerator we're going to have x times the square root of 7x times the square root of y. In the denominator we're going to have the square root of y times the square root of y, or the square of the square root of y, which of, of course is just y. And that's not too bad, except for we don't like two radicals being multiplied by each other. Because just so like we can split up the radical between two factors, if we have two factors being multiplied together and they're both square roots, well we can put them back underneath the same radical and it looks a little bit better. So this would be x times the square root of 7xy all over y. We just use the product property of radicals to put these back underneath the same square root. And now we're all simplified. There's certainly no perfect square factors underneath this radical. There's no radical in the denominator. There's no fractions inside the radical. And certainly no like radical terms that we need to combine. And that's great. And that's pretty much simplifying using the division property and rationalizing the denominator. So here's a couple of practice problems for you to work on until we get back to class. Thanks for watching.